Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G and welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, healthy gut, healthy mind, connecting the two. Have you ever had to decide on something by going with your gut or had a sensation of butterflies in your stomach when you felt nervous? Do certain situations make you feel nauseous? No doubt that most of us can say, been there, done that. The fact of the matter is that when faced with these scenarios, we are likely getting signals from an unexpected source, our second brain. Hidden within the walls of the digestive system, the brain in our gut is changing the way we think about gut health, brain health, and much, much more. Epidemiological researchers have turned up intriguing connections between the gut and brain disorders. When it comes to optimizing your overall health and well-being as it relates to your way of life, the gut-brain connection may prove to be one of the most essential and powerful keys toward unlocking the secrets to long-term health and well-being. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board-certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm so excited to have you guys here today. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Check me out, of course, at health360podcast.com and follow me across all social media at health 360 Dr. G. We are in for a treat today. Again, the gut-brain axis, we're going to be breaking it down. And But before we do that, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. I have one of my best people, my favorite guest, one of my favorite guests of all time. Uh, she and I have done so many collaborations in the past, and I just had to have her on today on Health 360 with Dr. G. You're going to meet Dr. Shivani Kirluck in a second. But again, I just want to preface it this way. Before you do anything, what we do today, what we do in this show each and every time we have Health 360 with Dr. G, is I want to make sure that you have the tools needed for success. One of the great things I say is write something down and then pay it forward. But the goal is for you. We are here for you. Let me and my team of experts help you be the best version that you can be. And we got your back along the way. So let's get right into it because we have a lot to talk about. So I want to introduce my guest, a uh, longtime friend, colleague. Um, she's taken care of so many of my patients. Uh, she's been just an advocate for lifelong learning, advocate for patients and doing and them doing well with their health and well-being. I want to introduce my good friend, longtime colleague, Dr. Shivani Kirilak. Let me read her credentials because her credentials run deep. Dr. Shivani Kirilak, board certified gastroenterologist at Suburban Gastroenterology LTD. Follow her on Instagram. Check her out at Shivani9331. Dr. Kirilak, welcome to the show. Hi, Dr. G. Thanks for having me on. Hey, I'm so excited that we're here today to talk about such an awesome, powerful, hot topic. Uh, Dr. Kirilak, every comic book ha hero has its origin story. There we go. Uh, give us your origin story. Where did you go to medical school, residency, fellowship, and why does this topic, why is this topic important to you? Sure. So I went to medical school at Midwestern University, which is an osteopathic medical school. And then from there, I did my internal medicine training, followed by my gastroenterology training at Loyola. And since that time, I've been at Suburban Gastroenterology for the past nearly eight years. Um, and I, I just loved I love the field. Uh, it's always interested me. It has a close uh, relationship to nutrition and I, I enjoy doing procedures as well. Um, as it relates to the topic today, I actually minored in psychology at Northwestern where I did my undergrad. So I've always been interested in the mind and its connection with the body. That is awesome. So I love it. Well, there you go, everybody. You met Dr. Kirilok. We're going to get right at it. Those of you that are familiar with the show, of course, I'll have some general overviews. We'll get into some frequently asked questions. And of course, I've got a sick myths versus facts for you today, but let's just get right at it. For, at the, at it. You know, when people come to our office, Dr. Kirilok, we call that the chief complaint. Uh, the chief complaint is, is, again, why are they there? So the chief complaint today on today's topic of the gut-brain axis, healthy gut, healthy mind connecting the two, is as follows. How are the gut 
and brain connected. So let's get right into it, Dr. Kerluck. So when you think about gut brain connection, you know, one of the, you know, it's such a hot topic. Everybody's talking about gut brain. Uh, when you think of gut brain connection, what does that mean to you? Sure. Well, um, they are definitely connected. We know that just going back, um, you know, they share a common embryological uh, basis. So actually in the developing fetus, you have the neural cross, which develops into the brain and spinal cord and actually sends down ganglia into um, the endoderm, which becomes the digestive tract or the lining of the GI tract. And so you have over a hundred million neurons in the GI tract that is in constant communication with the central nervous system. So there's definitely, definitely a connection there. And, um, and that's why uh, that brings us to our topic today. So, you know, I always thought it was powerful when, when I first started exploring this concept of gut brain uh, and it's been growing and there's so much more research and we're going to talk a little about the history of the, uh, of, of what's going on and we'll touch on some gut microbiome stuff, but I always thought it was powerful to know that again, as you just said, as it, the gut is our second brain, it's developed from that same tissue as our brain develops. But I think about, you know, we have this complex signaling process. It's just it's amazing when you look at the human body, this complex signaling process from our gut to our brain and from our brain to our gut. It's literally like an elevator in a building going up and down, but connecting everything too. So this complex signaling pathway is so powerful in what we do. So I just love talking about this topic. So let me ask you this. Uh, one of the questions I get asked quite a bit as it relates to how the gut and brain are connected uh, is, is as follows. You know, you mentioned a little bit about uh, about the systems that are connected. We call that the enteric nervous system. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about this? You, you, you said about 100 million neurons that are, in, that are lined in the, in the GI tract. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, there are actually two different networks of neurons. So you have one that lies within the smooth muscle layers of the gut, and that is involved in you know, contractility um, and motility of the GI tract. Uh, and then there's a second network of neurons that are in the submucosal layer. So a little bit closer to the contents in our lumens. So, you know, the foods that we eat, you know, it's constantly communicating there and, um, you know, is involved in secretions into the gut lumen, as well as just the blood flow into the GI tract. So you have, um, you know, these two really large networks of neurons that, again, are in con constant com uh, communication with the, the brain and the spinal cord, um, as well as just with what's going on inside the, the lumen or inside the gut. So when you think, you know, when I think about like gut and brain, and, and again, we're going to talk a little bit more uh, in a bit about just the profound uh, results to some of the disease states that may be present, some of the manifestations, uh, where you're looking at one system affecting the other and vice versa. Um, one of the things that really kind of connects a lot of things to try to get this new understanding about the gut and the brain is the gut microbiome. So what I want to do for the audience is, is I want to just kind of set the tone because a lot of people probably heard that term, but may not know exactly what it means. So you know, let me ask you this, Dr. Carla, can you explain what the gut microbiome is and how that may influence, or how it not even may, how it does influence our health and well being. Sure. So the microbiome has, you know, trillions of microorganisms, not including not only bacteria, but um, viruses, fungi that live in us and on us. And they're involved in digestion, they're involved in, um, you know, actually vitamin synthesis. So there's certain vitamins that only the bacteria, um, you know, synthesize such as vitamin K and folate. Um, they're involved in our mood and the way we handle stress. Uh, and then, you know, in a whole host of immune related activities. So they're part of our innate immune system and they help tell us, tell our bodies, you know, what to fight and what not to fight, um, in terms of, you know, different bacteria coming into our gut and, and, and things like that. So, um, it is very, very important in different types of diseases, because when, once you alter that microbiome, um, you can get, uh, you know, a, a dysbiosis and, generally those, those good gut flora that normally help us in all these activities no longer can do their job. Um, so we, it is so important to, 
have a healthy gut flora and, um, and, and, and so there's, you know, a ton of research that's just exploding in this area. Oh my, oh my gosh, the research is, is on fire. And one of the interesting things that I see now a lot of gastroenterologists uh, in, in your field looking at gut health as it relates to uh, uh, brain manifestations, uh, some of the disorders that you see on a common basis, on a daily basis, like irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and vitamin deficiencies are people that have had uh, uh, you know, bariatric surgery or a whole host of things. And on the flip side, we're seeing a lot of people that study the brain look at a lot of the GI manifestations. So we're looking at people that have, whether it's like, as you said, stress, anxiety, depression, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, such as like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, or even look at developmental disorders like autism. And we're seeing this, this, this amazing uh, kind of, um, this, this, this synergy, this, this growth, this profound uh, uh, detail in, in how we're, we're developing. I just think it's a fascinating time to be uh, in this field, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about that one. So let me ask you this question. Uh, you know, we're talking about, you were talking about, I want to just pick, pick your brain a little bit more about the microbiome. You yeah. know, from what I understand is that um, uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, funded the Human Microbiome Project. Uh, and I believe it started in 2007 and ended, I think, in 2016 or so, somewhere around that time frame. But, but, but what do we know about, why, why did we do we know why we decided to study this? Because this has certainly been a catalyst for just, just, all this growth that we're seeing. Do we know why we started to study the uh, human microbiome? <laughs> well, I, I do think that, you know, I mean, this first started back in the 1880s um, with actually Peter Escherich and he isolated E. coli and that we saw that that was involved in a diarrheal illness and in children and adults. And, and so from there, you know, they started isolating these types of bacteria. But honestly, I think we just realize that there is such a huge association with um, health versus illness relating to the gut microbiome that really started um, in the first decade of the 21st century. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, it, it's just kind of evolved since that time. And now when we um, see that the microbiome is so different, um, you know, in someone with a certain illness and then, then a healthy control or someone who doesn't have that illness, um, you know, it really gives us insight on maybe we can, uh, do things to alter our gut microbiome or, or, you know, prevent, um, you know, those kind of disruptions <laughs> with, you know, broad spectrum antibiotics, if they're unnecessary, things like that, you know, which really disrupt our gut microbiome. So um, I do think that there's going to be just, I mean, a real promise of, yeah. uh, in the future of, of trying to um, find ways that we can change it to kind of restore homeostasis and, and get the gut flora to do what it's supposed to do for us. So you know, yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> you know, I, like, I like how the old, saying, the old saying, is this an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? And there's sure. no doubt when we're thinking about uh, the things that we can do on, on on not only a microscopic but even a macro level on how it can impact health and well-being. You know, it's like who doesn't want to have longevity and vitality and quality of life? Some of the things that I, I alluded to in the beginning. You know, seeing where the gut plays a role in this and how we develop uh, for everything is just just phenomenal. So I just love that we're talking about this kind of thing. So let me ask you this question because again, a couple other uh, things that people ask you quite a bit. When well, you mentioned about like kind of good the good gut flora. And this is something that people ask all the time. So here's a question, uh, Dr. Kirillik, is there, is there truly such a thing as good bacteria and bad bacteria? Yes, absolutely. So the good bacteria, again, are part of our innate immune system. So they help us fight illness. They're involved in digestion. Um, you know, they honestly are thought to kind of, you know, help restore health for us. But, um, uh, you know, when, when you have a problem with the gut microbiome, um, honestly, there's oftentimes missing bacteria or a lack of diversity um, in the bacteria. And of course, there's pathogens, which are considered the bad bacteria. And, and those can be, um, you know, 
types of bacteria that cause infections or make us feel unwell. So it's, it's the disruption of the normal microbiome. And then you get different pathogens that kind of take over and we lose that, you know, diversity that we, that we really need to stay healthy. So I got you. Let me ask you a follow-up question to that one. Uh, so uh, people, it's, it's interesting because I think one of the questions that I get asked quite a bit, you know, we, people say like, oh, doc, you know, should I, should I be, in, you know, we're talking about good and bad bacteria. Should I be on a probiotic? And if so, how, how, how do I choose? You know, when you, I'm sure you get asked that question quite a bit. What's your typical response when somebody asks you, uh, uh, hey, should I be on a probiotic and which one should I choose? Sure. So I get that question about every day. <laughs> that's <laughs> what I not, figured. Yeah, that's what if I figured. not multiple times a day. And honestly, it's always been a, a hard one to answer because um, you have, you know, your patients who tell you that anecdotally it makes them feel better. And um, the question is, is, is there some harm? Is there any harm to probiotics? And, um, and what do we know about them? Um, and there is, of course, some can be some placebo effect for anything you take, but, um, you know, our society, the American gastroenterological society just came out with some guidelines and they looked at the studies, um, regarding the use of probiotics and when we should tell our patients that they should, you know, um, should use them. And unfortunately the problem is, is that the studies, um, involved in probiotics are, um, very incongruent. So you have the studies using different um, species, um, different preparations, different strains, different amounts. Um, you know, the endpoints that are studied vary. So it's very hard to study this. And even with some of the harmful side effects, they're just not well reported. So, um, you know, they're, they don't give us a lot of good consensus in terms of in which scenarios should we be recommending them? I mean, there is a scenario, um, a few, that there is some evidence, some you know, scientific research-based evidence based on um, different meta-analyses that they've done, uh, and that's you know, for someone who's had um, Clostridium difficile in the past, who's going to be on an antibiotic, there is a possible role for being on a prebiotic when you take an antibiotic for another indication. Um, another one of the recommendations was in, um, in preterm infants. So that is sometimes uh, can be helpful, you know, to prevent necrotizing enterocolitis. So there's a few, there's another indication in a subset of um, inflammatory bowel disease patients who have had most of their colon removed mm -hmm. to um, treat pouchitis. And that, you know, again, there's all this literature that I think, I mean, it will change. We'll have more guidelines, but this is really what's evidence-based right, right now. So this is a, this is what we've gathered from um, all of the literature. And I think once they start, you know, regulating, um, you know, these, if, if they do, I'm not sure if they start regulating the probiotics, it would be probably easier to study them. So yeah, you know, it's, it's just fascinating that that, the, that as the research continues to go, we're seeing more, it's not like we're flying by the seat of our pants, we're actually seeing some more data, and we are a data-driven society, and certainly we are data-driven professionals, you and I as physici physicians, sure. and we want to do what's best for our patients, we, don't, we want to study this right and follow the science. You know, one of the things that I think about when I, when I think about, again, gut and brain and brain and gut, uh, one of the things uh, uh, that I want to tell uh, you amazing people out there listening to Health360 with Dr. G <laughs> Uh, is that the main nerve that actually connects uh, our gut and the brain is called the vagus nerve. And that uh, nerve sends signals up and down. But another thing how the brain and the gut are connected is really through a process uh, through chemicals uh, known as neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are an amazing way to really tell the systems what to do. And we know that um, as they're connected through these neurotransmitters, you know, these, uh, the, we know that the, the transmitters that are in your brain um, as those neurotransmitters work in the brain, they, 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 they fuel emotion, they, they fuel feelings, they fuel behavior. And at the same time, when we think about uh, in the gut, they may also allow for symptoms. One of the things about the gut, I always like to tell some people, uh, mm -hmm. tell some of my patients, uh, Dr. Kira, look, I always kind of say like, you know, if your gut's feeling off, you know, you feel off. 
<laughs> you know, and I think yeah. about, okay, and, and, and I kind of tell them, well, well, the gut's got all, all, you know, it's got 90% plus of serotonin receptors and that's your, well, they're, you're feeling a well-being. So, so I, I know that it's like, it's like we, when we're off in our gut, we feel off in our mood. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing that, that that's how that's where we're seeing and and, and again and, you know there's one thing that's out there um and uh, i have yet to meet one of these individuals but uh i was reading something about uh, uh this is what i was reading about dr dr Kerlick. i was reading about a, a psychiatrist now that are doing something called nutritional psychiatry uh and nutritional psychiatry being a, uh, a growing field where it looks at the influence of diet on our mental health and knowing that as a dietary standpoint our diet regulates or dysregulates a lot of aspects in the body and, and if we have dysregulation in the gi tract because of poor diet and that's affecting our gut microbiome that can in turn lead to some of the mental health challenges we're seeing it's just a fascinating thing oh, yeah. uh I, I think i think it's something called like a food mood uh, i love the rhyme food mood mood food uh, I feel good. Uh, don't, don't we, don't you feel good? We have a good meal. Uh, yes. <laughs> I do all the time. That's me every day, but people know that it's all good. <laughs> all right. Let me ask you this question. All right. So, uh, interesting thing is, uh, I want to ask you this question about related to, um, gut health, uh, and, and just to get a little bit on just a little bit more about what we're seeing about some GI problems, potentially causing brain problems, neurological problems and neurological problems, uh, causing, um, GI problems. So, uh, common a common thing, thing I think about like celiac disease mm -hmm. you know what do you see when you're seeing your patients with celiac disease or even inflammatory bowel syndrome or uh, sorry irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease let's cover those couple things you know what are, do you see some of the manifestations on the neurological system when you're seeing these patients yes absolutely so for celiac disease you know there is um it's more of a, a, an immune condition so you have antibodies to gluten which is in uh, wheat, rye, and barley. And basically, um, you know, the lining of your small intestine is completely disrupted. So it's also a malabsorptive process. Um, so your gut lining is, is, you know, destroyed there. Um, but a lot of patients with celiac have, you know, they could have minimal GI symptoms and <laughs> they, they may have, you know, uh, um, other symptoms, um, ranging from neurological symptoms with, you know, problems with memory, um, neuropathy, balance issues. So there's a lot, it could be from different vitamins and minerals that aren't being well absorbed, but, um, whether or not there is, you know, like a toxic effect of, of gluten in, in the central nervous system. I mean, there is definitely, you see that gut brain connection in in a lot of GI conditions, um, you touched on, uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, you know, that is also kind of thought of as an, an immune immunological disease. So it's basically an autoimmune disease where your body is attacking the lining of the GI tract. And, um, you know, what happens, of course, if you have the enteric ner nervous system and the neurons and the lining, and that's getting destroyed. So of course you have, um, problems with the ability to function properly in, in that regard, and then absorption, because now you're lining, you don't have right. that barrier that's intact. Um, and then what happens a lot of times is that these uh, disruptive GI symptoms go on to cause anxiety. And, and for some people just like worry, um, depression, and, and then you can get an overlapping irritable bowel syndrome, okay. which is, um, a, a normally considered a, a mind gut condition, but, um, you know, I mean, that just exacerbates the, the underlying GI condition. So you've got these overlapping conditions all the time where it could be something that started out as, you know, more of a considered immune condition. And then now you have, um, you know, what, what we term as an, a, fun, a functional component right. where the brain is, um, basically causing these signals to the gut and creating these over, overstimulated, um, pain, you know, signals. And, um, and then there, there ends up being a feedback loop because once you're not feeling well, then you got more of the worry symptoms and then the worry and the stressful thoughts create physiological arousal in your gut in terms of like pain or altered motility. So 
It's a vicious cycle. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, this is like, uh, and, but this is why I'm so, so awesome. I mean, I love that the fact that, you know, you, you're dedicated when you see your patients. Cause I know you, you I mean, my patients tell me, it's like, no, we're going to try to make, we're going to try to write the ship as best we can. And, and even when I'm seeing some patients, I'm like, okay, you're having these GI issues and, and maybe you have an underlying neurological issue with some GI manifestation. I'm like, we're going to try to figure this out. Uh, because again, we want you to, to be there with us, but the science is still evolving, but we're trying to do the best we can. And I appreciate you. Yeah, Let me ask you this absolutely. question. Common thing that's asked me. I love this question. All right, here we go. Uh, I'll, I'll lead, I'll lead, lead into this one. All right. Okay. One can argue that diet has the most powerful influence on the gut microbiome. So here's the question. What foods help the gut microbiome and then what foods actually hurt it? Okay. Well, there's def definitely natural, naturally occurring um, probiotics and prebiotics. So probiotics are uh, basically the live organisms or cultures that kind of confer the same health benefits of the good gut flora. So we see that in yogurt, like Greek yogurt, kefir, kimchi. I actually was at nice. the the doctor's day lunch today. And I, I was thinking of our topic. I had a plate of kimchi today. By you know? way, I, I, I totally missed the doctors. <laughs> you know, why do the doctors things happen on the day I'm set to record a, a podcast? You know, <laughs> it's all good. but how was it? It was good. It was nice. <laughs> so they yeah, had, so they had the kimchi. Nice. That's awesome. The hospital they had kimchi. Had kimchi. Yeah. <laughs> That, that, that's progressive without that's a doubt. Impressive. Yeah, it's impressive. impressive. It, it wasn't just, you know, it was just burger, pizza. burgers and fries and stuff. And <laughs> right, pizza. Right. That's usually what it is. People don't know that, you know, at the doctor's lounge, it's usually junk food. I'm it just is. Telling a little secret to the listeners out there, Health 360 with IG, but break it down. Tell us yeah. a little bit more about the foods that support and the things that don't support. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So, um, okay. So probiotics and then of course, whole grains. Um, so, you know, barley, and then you have your legumes, um, of course, vegetables, uh, tomatoes. So, you know, pickled radishes or pickled, um, beets, um, pickles in general, <laughs> sauerkraut. Nice. So all those things, you know, we have natural, um, prebiotic, probiotics, I'm sorry, and then naturally occurring prebiotics and prebiotics are the, um, the foods that kind of nourish the probiotics. So, you know, your berries and bananas and, um, and all those things are, you know, the legumes, those are, those are the, the prebiotics there. So, um, honestly, I think having a diet that's rich and naturally occurring probiotics, prebiotics, whole foods, you know, vegetables, getting your fiber in, um, I, those are all important. So, um, I think that the foods that kind of work against <laughs> the gut microbiome are the processed foods, the, the foods that are rich in sugars, um, the ones that are, you know, kind of common sense, just not good for your body in general. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think about some of the, you know, sometimes we don't know what we're doing until maybe it's too late or we're having symptoms. You know, I, I think this is a really, I'm calling out right now on Health 360 with Dr. G, calling out the food industry for the ultra processed foods that are out there that are very addictive, yeah, sure. that are actually destroying our gut lining. Uh, but they're so darn addictive, but it's so, it's so devastating in so many ways, not just from a gut health standpoint, but even things like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, uh, cancer risk, but, but, but we are still victims of that. And do, do we know, I mean, do we know the impact? Uh, I mean, I don't know if there's any like large studies that look at the, 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 um, the dysfunction diet, the dysregulated diet on how we do, are we seeing anything like that? Well, I mean, I do think that you know, when you have an illness like obesity, I mean, again, if, if you look at um, the types of bacteria and the variety of bacteria that you see in someone who has obesity, you know, it's not as varied, it's not as diverse as someone gotcha. who doesn't have obesity as one of their health problems. So I think that that's kind of the main threat that, that you're seeing with a lot of these illnesses. And, you know, the next level of research is going to try and identify which exact strains of bacteria are missing and, you know, can a probiotic really change the microbiome? I mean, of course, some of that gets, gets, you know, killed off in the stomach with the acid. I mean, what's the best way to kind of get to that change? And 
I know that we've talked in the past about the, you know, fecal microbiota transplant. I mean, which is, you know, usually you're instilling this bacteria directly into your colon, um, you know, and what's going to be the new wave of research regarding that kind of treatment, you know, is that going to be more effective? I mean, all of that, I think still we need more science and it's, it's exciting. It's, I mean, who knows what's going to, what treatments are going to evolve in the next, you know, 10 years. Thanks, Dr. Carolyn. Mm -hmm. Let's get into a section here called Frequently Asked Questions. Uh, And you guys are listening here on Health 360 with Dr. G. I'm sitting down here with uh, my good friend, longtime friend and uh, expert colleague, Dr. Shivani Carolyn from Suburban Gastroenterology, LTD. Um, So we're having just an amazing discussion on gut-brain access, uh, talking about the role of uh, the interplay between the two organs, uh, the two systems, and its effect on health and well-being. Let's get into some FAQs, y'all. So here we go. Here's the first question. I'll give this to you, Dr. Kirluck. FAQ, here we go. Love it. Uh, How do you restore healthy gut flora? Okay, so as an adult, it is difficult, to be honest, to change your, uh, your gut microbiome, but we can help with eating um, diverse foods, which may help with the metabolites that are produced by the flora in our gut. Also, um, you know, like I alluded to previously, uh, just being very careful about antibiotics. Like I can't say that enough, the antibiotics wipe out (laughs) your flora. So, and, and some people can still weather the storm and, and they can restore their good healthy flora, but, um, you know, just being very careful with, you know, whether or not you really need it. And then, um, just trying to limit the, so it's a narrow spectrum, spectrum antibiotic. Um, so those are some of the things, um, obviously, uh, you know, fiber, as I mentioned, so the foods we eat, um, a lot of your microbiome originates when you're very young. So, um, those early years are very important, you know, maybe getting a little bit of that, um, those germ exposures. So, you know, it's not always a bad thing. <laughs> Got it. All right, here we go. I'll take the next one. FAQ. This is for Dr. G. Here it is. Can antibiotics cause depression? I'll answer this, the answer it this way. Uh, we know from large scale prescribing of antibiotics that overall depression rates, uh, are increased in patients who take antibiotics. However, this increase, while undoubtedly real, is not necessarily massive. So for an individual, if you're looking at the individual level, the risk of becoming depressed because of an antibiotic is actually small. There we go. Next question. Uh, Dr. Carroll, I'm going to come back to you at this one. One more question related to gut flora. So I just said the word antibiotics, and we were talking about it a second ago. So um, how do you restore the flora after an antibiotic? Do you advise people to, to take a probiotic? What, what, do, you, what do you do? So in the guidelines that were just published in 2020 from our gastroenterology uh, society, you know, they actually do not recommend that there, there, we just don't have enough evidence for that right now. Um, so a lot of times people want to go on a probiotic when they're taking antibiotics, but, um, that hasn't been, you know, really the, the literature hasn't supported that. Okay. Gotcha. All right, here we go. Next question. I like this one. Uh, Dr. Carroll, this one's for you. Here we go. Many, here's a statement, many, uh, statement of question. Many of my patients come back from naturopaths and functional medicine doctors with the advice to avoid daily, uh, to, sorry, to avoid dairy and gluten, and they are not lactose intolerant or celiac. Would this be useful for gut health? You know, again, I think they have to talk about that with their physician or their, you know, gastroenterologist. I mean, Unfortunately, you know, if you go on a gluten-free diet, then it makes it very hard for us to diagnose celiac. I mean, and, and I, I do want to distinguish between true celiac and a non-celiac gluten sensitivity in my patients. So, I mean, there are, you know, there are people who feel just better being off of it, but that, that, you know, kind of hinders the, that diagnosis. And then, you know, sometimes those diets can be restrictive. I'm not saying that, um, it's not something I might even tell my patient to do. I mean, a lot of times I, I do recommend those kind of things, but it's just after a good discussion about it. Gotcha. All right, here we go. Yeah. I'll take this one. This is for Dr. G. Freaking ask question. Love it. How can I change my gut to improve my mood? Love this question. Um, actually, some questions, some patients of mine ask me this question quite a bit. So my answer is this. Um, 
to uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep it on a dietary answer. So increase the intake of fruit, vegetables, nuts, uh, fermented foods, and of course decrease the consumption of the ultra processed uh, foods as well too. And I also say um, kind of piggybacking what Dr. Kirlik said earlier, uh, uh, limiting limiting those artificial sweeteners. Uh, genetic, genetically modified organisms as well too. And another way to just inf influence your gut, um, no smoking, uh, control stressors <laughs> and exercise. There we go, I love it. Here we go, Dr. Uh, Kirillok, I love it, here we go. Question for you, I like this one. Uh, Dr. Kirillok, uh, do you know if any research group has looked at fecal microbial transplantation for depression? So there was something I, I had to, you know, look it up. I mean, there was a study, um, I think it was in BMC psychology, but basically it was looking at, um, it was a meta-analysis and it included looking at, um, 21 different studies. And basically the conclusion was that, uh, it seems to be helpful. So the transfer of, um, healthy microbiota into someone who has a mental health illness seems to confer some benefits, but the, unfortunately the inverse is also true. So um, if, if stool from someone with um, depression or anxiety type of symptoms or behaviors are instilled into a healthy um, person, you know, it can, you can, they can get some of those same symptoms. Um, so we have to be really careful with yeah. this. It, it, you know, we know that we use it in treatment of um, recurrent C. diff and it has a very high success rate. So I, I do think it's like a powerful weapon that has to be used with caution. <laughs> <laughs> I agree hundred percent. Here we yeah. go. I'm going to come back at you with this question. Here it is. I'll do, it'll be a statement and a question. Here's a statement followed by a question. I face an onslaught of pseudoscience and unfounded causative claims around the microbiome and all of human health and disease. What are some of the strengths and limitations you've identified in researching the gut brain access? Sure. Um, well, when it comes to, you know, the use of probiotics, the use of probiotics have definitely outpaced what we've gathered from scientific literature. So I, I think there's just a lot of marketing and unfortunately, um, you know, people just want to, uh, get better with taking a natural supplement, but, um, you know, if, if it helps you, of course, if, and you feel better, of course, you know, that's good. I think in general, I mean, most of the time they're safe, but, um, the problem becomes is, you know, if, if you don't see your doctor about it, then you could delay a very important diagnosis that can have a lot of serious health implications. So I just worry that it's just one of those, you know, easy fixes that people want to do. And unfortunately there could be, um, you know, and unfortunate consequences. To I that, got you. So. All right. Yeah. I'll take this one. Here's a one. We'll do a couple more of these FAQs. Love it. Uh, this one's for Dr. G. Uh, question. Are there any tips for improving the gut brain connection? And my answer is this. The key is good, broad ranging diet and a lot of the foods that support us to healthy whole, whole foods, a lot of predominantly plant-based foods and regular aerobic exercise. Why not? Love it. Here we go. Dr. Mm -hmm. Kirill, look, I guess when I'll give you this last question in the FAQs, and we'll get into some awesome myths versus facts. So I love it. Here we go. Uh, what advice can I give my patients about rectifying a gut imbalance? I usually refer to a local nutritionist who specializes in these areas, but this person is expensive and not everyone can afford to see this individual. Sure. Um, it's interesting because I was just reading an article in the Wall Street Journal that talks about, you know, how they're going to now use your gut microbiome to tell you what type of diet you should be on. So, um, there I'm is, listening. Is, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, my, be I'm the trying new, to improve my gut microbiome. The new, there you go. <laughs> the startup. I mean, and you have these interesting kits that you can do, you can get a stool analysis. Um, I mean, they're expensive and, you know, it might just be a snapshot in time. I'm, I'm not sure, but, um, you know, I think that, uh, like we've kind of discussed, I mean, honestly, seeing a nutritionist, um, to just talk about, you know, looking at 
the person as a whole, you know, what things make them feel good. I think you listen to your body too, is just as important doing a food diary and, and you don't have to see a nutritionist. You can talk to your doctor first and they can decide whether or not they think, you know, you need to go that extra step. So. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Carol. Let's get into some awesome myths versus facts. Myths versus facts. So for those of you that are new to health 360 with Dr. G, I see the statement and we'll, me and my expert clinician will say myth or fact, we'll explain it. We'll try to go boom, 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 try to get through as many of these cans, but it's all about setting the record straight. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So I want you guys out there that are listening uh, to, have the, be, to be armed with the right information. And of course, if there's any questions that you have, please do not hesitate to talk to your physician. He or she will be there for you to rescue you, to answer all questions. And again, trust your source. No, so I should say trust your source. Know your source where you're getting information. And again, one of the best ways to get it from is your doctor, without a doubt. So here we go. Miss versus fast. I like, I like this. Here we go. Dr. Carol, like myth or fact. Here's a okay. statement and please explain. Here we go. Uh, your gut has capabilities that surpass all that. Oh, sorry. I, I can't even say that. Say this right. I'm messing up my own, my own statement. I'm, and I'm reading this too. Those people that are out there like, oh, Dr. G, I'm reading this statement. I can't, can't rewrite it. It's all good. So I'll say it again. Here you go. Dr. Carol, okay. here's the statement. Sure. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Your gut has, I'm so excited. That's why, you know, we're talking about awesome uh, you know, gut health stuff, gut brain. Love it. It's an exciting topic. So I'm just excited and I'm mumbling my words. Here we go. Your gut has capabilities that surpass that of all your other organs and even your brain, myth or fact. So <laughs> that's a hard one to, for me to say, to answer, because I think the brain is pretty impressive. Um, I mean, it does have, you know, billions of neurons, um, you know, I mean, I guess the microbiome is, is trillions of bacteria. So I, I kind of want to see how this, this research plays out. I really do, but I, I'm still impressed with the brain and, and they work together. So yes. I don't know if it's, we can compare them like apples and oranges because they're really on the same spectrum. So awesome. I'll take that answer. I love it. Yeah. Here we go. This one's for Dr. G. Here we go. Myth or fact. There is a bacterial population that lives in your intestine called the gut microbiome. And I'll call it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll reach, uh, first of all, I'll say fact, but I'm going to restate that because I don't like the word bacterial population because we know there's other microorganisms. So I'm going to say it this way. Um, I will call it a complex living system, an mm -hmm. ecosystem community of microorganisms that live in our gut, known as the microbiome. There we go. I like it. Dr. Kerlick, here's the statement, myth or fact, healthy gut flora can be restored. To some degree, yes. All right. I like how I'm giving you like in between questions. It's like it's like myth. Yeah, you're giving me the hard good. ones. It's not I, well, fair. You know, you know, it's 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 my, it's my it's my show. That's that's what I do. Plus, you're a dear friend of mine, so that's that's what that's what friends do apparently uh, to each other. Uh, okay. So, uh, but please explain. <laughs> okay, I mean it is hard. So I mean, you know, that microbiome is really kind of set. That blueprint is set in in infancy, and um, a lot of things affect that. Um, so, you know, as we get older, we, we kind of damage it based on things we do. Um, and, you know, I think it, it can be somewhat restored and a lot of times we can weather the storms, like I kind of mentioned before, but, um, you know, just trying our best to, again, eat those whole foods, um, getting the fiber, doing the exercise, avoiding the toxins, um, those are all going to be helpful. Excellent. Here we go. I like this one. I'm going to take this next one. This is for Dr. G. Our human bodies might just be a vehicle for the microbes living in it. However, we are inseparable and dependent on each other for survival. So I'll say that's a fact. Uh, we have co-evolved as a species. Again, we are, we are now seems to be the research that we are more dependent on the uh, the microorganisms that are living in us more depend on that than our own human DNA. So are we, this is the question, it's the paradigm. Are we just in a, just in just a, 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 a kind of a vehicle for the microbes or are the microbes a vehicle for us? There we go. Love it. Here we go. Dr. Kier, look, I like this question. Here we go. Here's a statement. Um, myth or fact. When it comes to probiotic use, a greater number of colony forming units, CFUs, always equates with enhanced benefits. That is a myth. There Please you explain. go. I finally gave I you Please a explain. clear Love answer. It. Yes. No, no. <laughs> so more is not always better. I think, Love um, it. you know, just, I use the analogy of like having too much fertil fertilizer in your garden. So there's definitely has to be some balance. Um, and, and 
you know, I think we, again, we don't know exactly how much, what strains, all those details, as I like to call, call them, um, really, I think will come out in in the next decade. So hopefully. Wonderful. Love it. Here we go. Uh, I'll take this one. This is for Dr. G. I love it. Uh, here we go. You can increase your serotonin levels through medication and more natural options. So I'll say fact, but I'll say it this way. Um, we know that low levels of serotonin in the brain, uh, can lead to things like depression and anxiety, um, um, sleep issues and other kind of, uh, conditions. And that's why you see a lot of physicians that prescribe for mood disorders, prescribe serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. From a natural standpoint, I think it's just the things that we can do, uh, light exposure, you know, um, light therapy is a great thing. Sunlight exercise is an amazing way to boost serotonin levels. Your diet, of course, when you talk about the diet has to be regulated and not dysregulated. So the diet that Dr. Kira has, has talked about uh, the, that will support the gut microbiome is very beneficial. And I'm a big practitioner, Dr. Kirk, you like this one, mm-hmm. med- meditation. So that's what I like to say on uh, helping out my, because uh, I feel better. I feel my overall well-being feels great after meditation. Yeah. There we go. Good. Love it. Here we go. Dr. Kirk, I, I like this one. Here it is. Here's a statement. All fermented foods are probiotic foods. Myth or fact? That's a myth because I have at least one example. Um, Please. <laughs> so, well, beer, you know, it's, it's fermented by yeast, but then eventually you take out, you get rid of the yeast and the final product. So I think as a generalization, I mean, yeah, but not, not all, not all foods. <laughs> so beer lovers right now are just disappointed right now. The fact that we said <laughs> you cannot, you basically said we cannot drink beer to uh, improve our gut microbiome. <laughs> that is correct. It's like, man, uh, the Definitely food industry, the food industry is, is kind of like in the background, like, ha, 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 ha. and it actually <laughs> feeds more addiction in the food industry. So it is what it is. Thank you. All right. Dr. Yeah. Carroll, let me come back at you with another one. I like this one. Here's a statement. Myth of fact, we'll do a couple more of these. We, we still got some time. This is great. Love it. Here's a statement. Uh, fecal transplantation should be seen as a last option for patients with ongoing gut microbiome dysfunction. Myth of fact. Well, again, we do have an indication for recurrent C. diff, you know, um, but in terms of other conditions, we, we don't have the indication yet. Um, I think, I think we need, you know, the stool that is used in FMT is very much regulated. So, um, I mean, there's questionnaires, there's testing. So, you know, I think, uh, more studies are needed to see if there's, it's, it can be used for other indications. Got it. All right, here we go. I like this one. This will be for Dr. Chi. Uh, the modern diet is suspected to alter gut diversity and preempt neurodegenerative disease. And I'll call it a likely fact. Uh, this is why research um, continues in this field. Uh, the microbiome cannot afford to be dysregulated because it's going to lead to a host of other, other issues as we talked about. So I think as we continue to follow the science of the, in the evolution of the gut-brain access, uh, I think it's going to be important to, to say, at least from a diet standpoint, this, the standard American diet, which is the modern diet, uh, is, 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 right, is, is chock full of so many um, deleterious uh, effects on the human body. We know that through a whole host of diseases. All right, I like this one. Dr. Dr. Kirk will do a, just a couple more of this. I like this one. Here we go. Um, here we go. I like this one. Gut bacteria are involved in a host of immune and metabolic functions, myth or fact? That's a fact. Please explain. So, absolutely. I mean, it, it's involved in the way we, you know, um, metabolize foods and there's certain foods that we can't even metabolize or digest without our bacteria. It's involved in, um, how we, you know, store fats and how we regulate our blood sugar levels. It's affected in our mood. So there's, there's so many roles that it plays. Um, and you know, I mean, I'm sure there's even more that we haven't even discovered. So mm. <laughs> let's do Let's do one more. And, and I thought of this, I thought this with the fact for you, because what you guys are doing in your practice is really changing the game. You guys are very, um, you guys are very uh, innovative in how you approach gastrointestinal disorders. You're not afraid to bring in other experts that may not be from a traditional gastroenterology background, as far as allied health professionals 
to help out. So here's one just for you. Okay. All right, here we go. Uh, I like this one. Multi here's a statement, myth or fact. Multiple types of behavioral medicine treatments are available to people with gastrointestinal disorders. True. That's Please true. explain. So I'm glad you asked me that question because, um, you know, honestly, like we were talking about the whole gut brain access, you know, um, so there are from pharmacological therapies because there are, you know, similar neurotransmitters in the brain and the gut. So with the serotonin and the dopamine. And so that's why we can use previously, you know, uh, they're called antidepressants and anxiolytics. Um, but they're, we like to call them gut brain modulators. But we also know that um, kind of behavioral therapy, imagery, hypnosis, we do have um, research that shows that those things do help with this um, gut brain, these gut brain disorders. So um, that helps with, you know, just these worry thoughts that we have, like kind of behavioral therapy, um, those stressors cause, you know, physiological arousal in the gut. And so, you know, even a, a normal muscle movement can feel painful to someone who has a condition such as irritable bowel syndrome. And, and then that causes, you know, an abnormal, abnormal signal to go to the brain. And then again, I mean, like I was mentioning, the cycle just keeps going on. So kind of behavioral therapy will focus on coping mechanisms on, on your thoughts that are, are you know, kind of excessive and sometimes extreme and trying to, um, make them an, a little bit more neutral. And so they don't cause that physiological arousal. So wonderful. Thank you. There mm -hmm. you go. Myths versus facts. So we got about five minutes left and this is, okay. <clears throat> excuse me, this has been an awesome just discussion on gut brain health, uh, gut brain access, uh, and some, uh, key take on points, uh, that for you out there that's listening to Health 360 with Dr. G. So it's been awesome talking with Dr. Dr. Kirlook. So I said at the beginning, we called it the chief complaint when somebody comes into the office. You know, uh, at the end of the, at the end of our visits, of course, Dr. Kirlook, we call that the assessment and plan. And the assessment and plan, of course, is when we render a diagnosis, a treatment plan, of course, most importantly, scheduling a follow-up. So let's bring it on home. Dr. Kirlook, give us a couple uh, take-home points uh, for people out there that are listening to be successful when it comes to today's theme of the gut brain axis? Sure. So I guess the first one I would say is just, you know, tell your doctor about your stress or possible anxiety as it may be associated with your digestive symptoms. Um, so it's something that you, you should bring up, right? You know, right from the beginning, it's always good for us to know that. Um, the second thing is that, um, the best approach to, uh, disorders of the gut brain interaction, um, are often multidisciplinary. So I was just talking about, you know, kind of behavioral therapy, um, as well as we've talked a lot about diet and how important that is. And then of course there's pharmacological treatments, the, um, brain gut neuromodulators, which, you know, I, I you know, again, those SRIs can be used to help our patients with irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. That's they help with pain. They help with the motility aspect. Um, and a lot of it is really just talking to the patients and coming up with the right, uh, treatment program for them. And, and who knows, maybe probiotics will be, you know, um, updated to be one of the evidence-based treatments that we're going to use in the future. So it's, you know, the more open-minded someone can be, um, even, you know, things like you mentioned, meditation, yoga, really understanding, um, the, the effects of stress on our body is going to be critical in terms of getting them better. Wonderful. And then, yeah. Okay, and then keep I, going. You got one more. Go ahead. One more. I want Please. more that Love is just it. so important to me. And, um, you know, I think that when it comes to your symptoms, you know, there's just so much marketing about probiotics, prebiotics, cleanses, you know, this diet, that diet, and you really have to talk to your doctor because, um, you know, we don't want to miss a very important diagnosis. And so, you know, there's 50 causes of bloating. <laughs> and I mean, we really have to go through the gamut of the history, the, the, the symptoms, the family history, the labs, we really, really need to look at everything to kind of decide the right treatment program, the right tests that are needed to figure it out and make sure we're not missing something that, um, could really, uh, 
you know, Im- impair your well being. So that's my take awesome. home point. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Kerlock, uh, for that awesome take. So before we get to my final, uh, my final thoughts, let me hit you with the section that we do each time on, on Health 360 with Dr. G. Uh, it's called the listener healthy. Oh yeah. Content. Here we go. Here's a quote. I walked four miles in the morning, stuck to my diet all day, played 90 minutes of pickleball and drank two liters of water. That is from loyal listener, J G. Thank you, JG. Keep crushing it on your journey. And again, if you have any health goals or any health success stories, please share them with me. Of course, just follow me across social media. Send me a direct message at health 360 WDrG. And who knows, your story may be a catalyst for someone else who needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this. Your gut and brain are intimately connected through millions of nerves. And we know a lot about the growing science that is evolving with studying the gut-brain axis. And there's more research coming down the pipeline, without a doubt. Medical researchers who are studying depressive symptoms like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and autism and ALS and multiple sclerosis and pain and anxiety and a whole other host of neuro-related conditions, they are now beginning to look at the gut, what is going on in that person's guts. At the same time, researchers who are investigating ulcers and constipation and other GI conditions now have a reason to focus on aspects of brain function. There's still so much more to learn about how the gut microbiome influences the brain, but related studies can help scientists better understand and develop ways to support new treatment and therapies. It is truly an exciting time indeed. I wanna thank my amazing guest, Dr. Shivani Kirilluk uh, from Suburban GI Board Certified Gastroenterologist, Suburban Gastroenterology. Again, follow her across social media at Shivani9331 on Instagram. Thank you, Dr. Kirilluk. Thanks, Dr. G. It's a pleasure. Uh, I appreciate, I appreciate <laughs> you. You've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2021, Edward Elmer's Health. All rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health 360 podcastcom and follow me across all social media at health 360 W, Dr. G. This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace out.